9 to 11, we'll be talking about politics. We'll be talking about the state of things around us. Plus, we open the phones to your called in questions and comments. That's every Sunday morning, the Sunday show on Community Powered KPFA. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 3.30. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. I'm Monica Lopez, and this is Making Contact. Before I came to Oakland, I was news director at a student and community radio station in Santa Barbara called KCSB. This was one of the last events we covered while I was there. Much of the audio you'll hear today is from their archives. Around 4.30 a.m., May 24th, 2014. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the press. Uh, My name is Bill Brown. I am the sheriff of Santa Barbara County. I'm here to give you information on the incident that occurred in Isla Vista at uh, approximately 9.27 p.m. last night. This incident appears to be a mass murder situation. There's a pretty vibrant nightlife in Isla Vista, especially on a Friday. But by the time I arrived in IV the night of the murders, all I heard was the sound of my own car. Yellow tape blocked off streets. Police cars lit up curbsides. I parked my car and started walking toward a cordoned area. There was an officer in the middle of the street standing behind a thin ribbon of caution tape. I went up to him and asked him if he'd visited any of the crime scenes. He just forced a smile and tears welled up in his eyes. Okay, so this is this is where I this is where I was where I started. That's Bosch. My full name is Siadash Zuhuri. I go by Bosch. He's one UC Santa Barbara student who had direct contact with the shooter that night but wasn't physically injured. Others weren't as fortunate. Sheriff Bill Brown. We've identified nine separate crime scenes within the area and multiple victims who were either shot or injured as a result of, apparently as a result of the suspect's actions. Seven victims are in area hospitals being treated for gunshot wounds or for traumatic injuries. That includes the suspect and six victims. You might recall what happened in Isla Vista that night. It was one of many mass murders that have taken place in the last 10 years. San Bernardino, Umpqua College, Sandy Hook Elementary, Aurora, Orlando, Virginia Tech. Like those tragedies, this set of murders drew media in full force to Isla Vista. Hi. In this chilling video posted online, Elliot Roger described the mass killing he'd planned. Revenge, he said, for his failure with women. Police say 22-year-old Elliot Roger opened fire outside the Alpha Phi sorority house, a deli, as well as eight other locations in the small college town. Six people were killed, three of those stabbed in Roger's apartment. Thirteen others were hurt as Roger drove madly through the streets on Friday, firing out of his window and using his car to strike bicyclists and pedestrians. We are getting a much fuller picture of the alleged gunman in the Santa Barbara shooting rampage. Elliot Roger, the son of a Hollywood director who lived a life of privilege but whose writings and videos reveal a mind that is disturbed, isolated, grandiose, and enraged over his lack of luck with women. The record shows that Roger attacked men and women of all stripes, but his plan was to specifically target women for rejecting him over the years. In his plan, he said he would enter a sorority house and, in his words, slaughter everyone inside. The final police report, which came out months later, said that he had pounded on the sorority's locked door, but no one answered. So he went back to his car and shot three women on the sidewalk with a 9mm handgun and proceeded to drive through Isla Vista. That sidewalk was where Catherine Cooper and Veronica Weiss were killed. A third woman survived. While the shooter was in motion, Vash Zuhori was on a street that horseshoes around the center of Isla Vista. This is where I was, where I started. So, um, so I just got like a euro from this restaurant. It used to be called Pita Pit, and I and I came here because I was uh, I was getting ready for 
like a photo shoot the next day. And, and as I was unlocking my, my bike from the bike racks, I, I had heard heard the first gun sounds. Um, and I wasn't really sure what I what I should do. So 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 standing here, like I heard them on my left over there. So I was like, okay, I live over there, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go towards the right. And I started to go towards the 7-Eleven, and then do you want to walk towards the 7-Eleven or no? Yeah, well, just yeah. a second. Um, so you heard, you heard the gunshots. Did you know there were gunshots at the time? No, no. I thought there were... I was like, this sounds kind of weird because people are playing with firecrackers over there next to where all the restaurants are. That's, that's kind of odd. So I kind of thought there were firecrackers, but it was really suspicious at the time. So, so I unlocked my bike from over here, um, and I started to bike all the way just to- around the around the curve towards my dorm um and, and it happened over there and I actually <laughs> actually obey these traffic laws and and i stopped at um at this stop sign and as i started to pedal forward and, and pass the 7-eleven his car was coming up right over there right near ivy theater that orange building and, and he started to curve around the road and he was driving totally normally but then the thing that actually got my attention was instead of continuing on the road he drove on my side of the road so i was biking over here and we confronted each other and he stopped in front of me and at this point i was like okay maybe this guy's just gonna drop off his friend so i'll start biking around him so i start to bike around him and, and before i knew it he had rolled his window down and shot three times and one guy fell and then he shot another two times and the other guy fell in front of me and then I saw those girls in front of those guys start running away, and I was like, okay, I, I should probably run run with those girls. And I followed the girls, and we were ducking along the parked cars and coming around the corner, and we ran inside of the 7-Eleven. It was about us and a couple more girls from the corner who had seen another girl get shot right after us. So the whole time that we were running away, we had heard the shooting, um, and, and we didn't look back the whole time. We were just like, we got to get out of here. My name is Kylie Scarlett, and I just formally was sworn out as uh, the AS internal vice president. I understand that you live right across the street from where the suspect's car crashed and that you Mm -hmm. were there. Can you talk about that? Yeah. um, So that evening, I was actually at 7-Eleven five minutes before he came back around. Um, And so I was at 7-Eleven, and I walked home, and I walked inside my house, and... um, about three minutes later, we heard a large crash into all of the cars. So um, everyone on the street ran out to make sure like people were okay. Um, my friend and I, he had hit a bicyclist. And so um, we went to try to make sure she was okay or still moving. At that time, uh, police officers swarmed from both sides of uh, Del Playa and um, told everyone that there was still open fire and we should run inside. And they came in on on foot, on, on foot. cars? Okay. Yeah, on foot at first, because um, I didn't see the police officer at first. I was, like, running to the car to see if, or to the girl to see if she was okay. And then um, we saw the police officers come in and pull him out of the car. So when you ran outside and you saw the car, had the police officers already gotten to the car yet? No. No. What did you see? Did you Were you checking out the car at all? Um, I saw the car, um, I was from the back inside, so mainly I just saw the bike, um, and then the girl had, like, the bike was very far away from where, uh, he was, or where the car was, but she was way over there as well, so, um, we knew it had been, like, a very high-speed hit, um, and I talked to a girl, because there's a couple houses with balconies there who were actually out on their balcony, that saw it and said that um, she was hit, flew, and went on top of his windshield. Um, so I, the car, the cars that were hit are still on our street right now. Um, one of them has a bullet hole in it, um, and the car was smashed up against the other, like into the other cars, and the cars had been thrown up onto the sidewalk. So it was evident. It was very, very fast. Yeah, we had just run inside uh, the 7-Eleven. 
Um, and we came up with this plan that we would escape through the back door in case Elliot Rogers, the shooter, would come through the front door. And we were in this back room, and the back room had, it was, it was, a, there was a dichotomy. Half of the people were, like, freaking out, really scared. I can't believe I was just at a shooting. But since it was a Friday night, half of the people were, were also drunk, and it was really uncomfortable. There was people yelling, yo, this is crazy. I live, this is crazy. This is, this is amazing. Turn up. Like, Ivy, all these things. And, and the room, like, expressed this strong dissonance of the people who were excited about their favorite DJ being in the room and, and these people who were, who were coping um, in a different and more open way. Um, and that was, that was the catalyst that actually allowed me to, to notice that people might be coping with, with things in their life in different ways. Kylie Scarlett, how do you think like your, you and your colleagues and your neighbors are kind of handling and coping with this? It's been honestly so beautiful to see um, everyone coming together um, and just really being there for each other. Um, I've never, like, Ivy's always been a community. Like, I can never explain how beautiful, like, we all are intertwined. Like, everyone knows each other. Like, you can't walk from your house to campus without seeing, like, ten friends. You know what I mean? Um, so it's it's very beautiful to have that sense of community, and I know it's only going to get stronger. Um, I've had so many friends just reaching out to me with, like, how can I help? What can I do? Like, let me know anything. Um, so we're holding together. This won't define us, this doesn't define us, and we're only going to get stronger. UC Santa Barbara and the communities around it have that small town feel. And in times of crisis, it manifests itself in sometimes unexpected ways. Census estimates for 2014 put Ella Vista at a population of just under 25,000. And Stork Tower, which is the Campanile near the center of campus, is taller than the tallest building in the city of Santa Barbara. On Saturday afternoon, the day after the murders, a few people showed up in Stork Plaza and started setting up tables. A little later, more people came with boxes of candles, hundreds of candles. So by early evening, there were thousands of people in the plaza. UCSB is the largest employer in Santa Barbara County with over 10,000 employees. This was a tragedy that deeply affected local people. Students, staff, faculty, alumni, local residents, elected officials, all stood together cupping their hands around the flames. The procession moved through campus toward Isla Vista. Past the makeshift memorial in front of Ivy Deli Mart, where Christopher Martinez was killed, and turned left into Anascoyo Park. Love is something that we have to do, but it means work. It means we have to ask hard questions and we have to wrestle with hard answers. Personally, I can't ignore that a hatred and a degradation of life, and especially a hatred of the lives of women, played a part in this terrible act. Now that it's happened, what's going to make people feel safe? Will you? Are you going to help cultivate a culture of respect? The fact that we're all still here is an incredible thing. That this started around sunset and we're still going strong. It's an incredible thing. I broke down a lot today because there's no really reason to say. I'm sure we all did. I know that in the coming days that follow, a lot of us are going to ask why. We're going to think about what we could have done, where we could have been, whether if in five minutes we could have been in a different place. Whether for one more minute I could have been around that corner in Amido and then in front of 7-Eleven, I know we will. And that's human. But all I ask is that we don't dwell on it. And that we remember this right here. My name is Phil Kodrat, and I just want to share a few words about one of my students in my computer science aid class. She came in a couple weeks ago. Uh, I have a policy you can make up one missed homework. And she had a missed homework. And uh, she came in and I started grading it, and I said, hmm, looks like you missed the first problem here. Why don't you, uh, I see I've got another student in line, why don't you take this back out in the hall and check your other answers, just to make sure you don't lose any more points, because every one of these is worth 10 points. 
A, she went back out in the hall. I worked with another student for five or ten minutes, and, and I said, hey, come back in. She goes, yeah, I checked the other answers. They're all right. And the first one's right, too. And I said, really? Let's see. Whoa, you're right. I was wrong. Good for you. Good for you. Very confident. I like that. And it turns out the mistake that I had made was a very common mistake, and I spoke about it in lecture. And I looked out as I was talking about it, and I said, you know, I made this mistake the other day. One of the students pointed out to me, and our eyes met, and she kind of raised her hand to go, yeah, I didn't want to single her out, but she's identifying herself. Veronica. Veronica Weiss. On Wednesday, I'll meet that class again, and I will look out right where she should be, and she won't be there. And I'll be very sad. Listening to Men, Women, and Guns: Toxic Masculinity in Mass Shootings on Making Contact. A look back at the Isla Vista tragedy and how one student survivor used his experience as a way to talk about toxic forms of masculinity, their relationship to mass shootings, and violence against women. Now back to Men, Women, and Guns on Making Contact. The Friday before Memorial Day weekend in 2014, a mass murder and suicide took place in Isla Vista. Six people were killed, 14 injured, and in the end, the killer took his own life. Kipis and local communities were in shock and mourning. But UCSB and Isla Vista are not unfamiliar with struggle and tragedy. In 2001, a UCSB freshman drove his car into a group of people. And here's the latest at 11. The suspect in this college tragedy, the 18-year-old son of a successful Hollywood director, is facing 13 felony counts, including murder charges. Officials say David Atias intentionally mowed down five people, killing four. So in 2014, the university had emergency protocols in place. But there's no way for students and staff to emotionally prepare for an event like this. Univision reporter Natalie Vero was associate news director at KCSB at the time. She was curious about the effects of traumatic events on communities and recorded this interview on the school's official day of mourning and reflection. KCSB spoke with Dr. Mary Ann Hoffman, professor and co-director in the Department of Counseling at the University of Maryland. Hoffman spoke to KCSB News about community trauma, emphasizing that more than one community is affected by the tragedy. Not only the Isla Vista community, but college women nationwide and other university students. I think that in a case like this, it, you can think of community effects as being uh, like towns or cities or areas of the country or schools. And so, you know, right away you could think of um, UC Santa Barbara as being a community that was affected or of um, Santa Barbara being affected or that area. But I think that because this, this, this young man who was the perpetrator had so many kind of grievances against so many groups of people, uh, like sororities. So if, I think what's happened is that a lot of, um, there's been a lot of women on Twitter, for example, feeling like the sort of misogyny or hatred that some men have toward women who won't have sex with them or who won't be their, their girlfriend or who won't respond a certain way to their, their wishes as expressed by this young man. They begin to feel like they're part of the community that's been affected as well. That's, that's really the Washington Post had a columnist write about that today and how so many women were feeling that when men, some men, don't get what they want when they meet a woman, that it turns to uh, almost like a hatred, you know, about frustrating people. Now, obviously, this, this is kind of an unusual case. This young man was mentally ill. People don't always handle the disappointments in life in the way that he did. But I think there's a lot of different communities that were affected, you know, like university campuses, towns. Uh, sororities, fraternities, college-age people, uh, just like I think that when there's school shootings, 
it doesn't just affect the school where it happened, but children in schools in general begin to feel unsafe. As you may have heard, at the university we had a vigil and we're having a memorial service today. And what would you say are, are some ways for, for a community to cope with this, with this type of trauma? Well, I think that sometimes people cope by taking actions that they think might address the sort of root problems with this. And I think that, um, I think one of the, the young men who died, Chris Martinez, I think his father made some very eloquent statements about, um, how we view guns and how we kind of tip the rights of people to own a gun versus the rights of people to not be injured or harmed or scared by guns. And I think that's a really important uh, point for people to think about, like, where does one person's, where do one person's rights end? You know, like if someone in some states in the United States now, people can carry visible guns into places like restaurants. And this might then kind of be by expressing their right to have a gun, they might be exp uh, kind of limiting someone else's right to feel safe. That's a really big issue. There's two really big issues here, I think. One is the Second Amendment and the fact that people can get so many explosive and guns so easily. And all the mental health background checks in the world probably won't stop that completely. The second is the mental health issues that mental health services, this particular young man did have mental health services, but in some cases people who have um, perpetuated violence have not had services or have not been identified. Like in our case, for example, there, there are people right by where um, Chris Martinez was shot in, in the, um, the Ivy Deli Mart. There are people with signs there that say, because there are, you know, several news crews there, and there are people with signs that, that say, respect our, our grief and, and demand that, that the news leave. And, and I, I've heard from, from other peers that I guess basically, you know, the coverage of this tragedy and, and the fact that it's, it's just constantly in our online media and on TV, everywhere, it, it makes it harder for people. So, Yeah, it can be traumatizing, and there's something called secondary traumatization where you can acquire trauma or, you know, PTSD-like symptoms from hearing about things or seeing things that happen to other people. I mean, if you look at the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder, it's usually the, it starts with the belief that you are in a situation that is life-threatening. And the, the media is trying to get the best story. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to always think about what's psychologically healthy. But I think that where people are most likely to get traumatized is if they see the place, if they smell things, if they hear things, you know, kind of sensory. And so I think for someone who lives around there walking by the places where the people were shot, Right. can just induce trauma just by the association. That's why Virginia Tech didn't use the classroom building for a year or two after the shootings that went on there. Do you think for some people, or I guess it would depend, but do you think for some people maybe watching that or, or passing by the place, like even if they weren't even if they weren't there, do you think for some people that may actually be a type of healing process or is it usually more of a traumatic? Well, I think there's kind of a line where, where sometimes um, part of our humanity is to feel pain and to feel um, empathy for other people. And sometimes we, we read about things so we can understand what that must have been like for the people who are most directly affected. That's what makes us human. If we have no interest in these events and no feeling of sadness and sometimes even wanting to understand them by seeing the place as a way of sort of paying homage to it. And, you know, some people will put flowers out because that makes them feel like they're honoring the people in some way. And I think that can be very helpful. The university canceled classes the day after Memorial Day and held a memorial of its own at the soccer stadium. Words cannot express the depth of sorrow, shock, and the pain. We share in the overwhelming heartbreak of their families, friends, and their classmates. We grieve the loss of these precious lives. George Chen, Catherine Cooper, James Hong, Christopher Ross Michaels Martinez, David Wayne, Veronica Weiss. Vice President Joe Biden. To the UC Santa Barbara students, alumni, families, friends, and especially to the graduating class of 2014, 
I know this has to be a pretty bittersweet moment for all of you. This year's commencement is obviously, like every commencement, a time to celebrate your achievements, to remember the hard work that brought you to this point, the friendships that sustained you, and the, and the dreams that are going to continue to carry you forward to new heights. But I know that your thoughts are with the victims of that on that terrible day, the, the survivors who are still recovering. You know, my mother used to have a saying. She said, Joey, courage lies in every heart, and the expectation is that one day it will be summoned. You reclaim this year's commencement for what it rightly should be, a celebration, a remarkable class with a brilliant future. Vosh graduated in 2016. Before he left the university, I sat in on one of his workshops on the myths of masculinity. Yeah, so I'm going to give a trigger warning for the Isla Vista shooting and maybe some sexual assault stuff. Um, and, if, and if you want to step out, usually the story lasts for five minutes, so you can step out for five minutes and come back in. This is the work he developed with his friend and sociology professor, Victor Rios. So just like a, a, a big step back, um, to when, when we think of like mass shootings, what, what comes to our mind? When we see mass shootings in the media, what topics come up? Mental health. Mental health. Gun laws. Mm-hmm. Gun violence, gun control. So I started to do a lot of research about, about mass shootings, and, and I kind of came to like these three myths of masculinity. The first myth is to get a lot of girls, the second myth is to get a lot of money, and the third myth is to have big muscles, right? And, and what do all these things function in our society to do? They give men power, right? This constant policing of masculinity that happens as we grow up in high school is internalized by all of our men, all of our boys. That's why men are always trying to prove themselves. But essentially the way that it works together is we're, we have this one factor where we're trying to prove ourselves and we have this one factor where we have these three myths of getting a lot of girls, having big muscles and having a lot of money and the way that these interact with each other is the second that one of these things is threatened, we try our most to, to overcome them and to show everyone that they're not. So when you look at mass shootings, a mass shooting is a compensation for the perceived lack of masculinity with the hyper-masculine display. So it's a lot of words, but essentially what it means is saying these kids weren't really looked at as masculine, they were all ostracized. After the workshop, Vosh and I had a chance to talk a little bit more. Earlier, he'd made a comment about the kind of empathy he thinks he would have shown Elliot Roger had he known him, and went on to say that he talks to kids who have similar feelings right now. I had a peer tell me um, that he understands or he can empathize with mass shooters. I've had students tell me um, that they think it was reasonable, or, or and I know that there are other students who, who identify with with the, the troubled upbringing that he had. You feel like you have met people like him? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think that the thing that I learned from this work is how real this thing is, like how, how there are students out here that are actually feeling this way. I interviewed um, a student who I knew about his life and his upbringing um, and took photos of him, but it remained confidential. I blurred his face, all these things, pitched his audio down in the, in the interviews, and this is the first kid who told me that he could empathize with mass shooters. But in, this, in the same interview, he shared with me all these hardships. And I did my best to, to listen to these hardships. But I realized that there are students like this around our campus that, that I can listen to. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. Men, Women, and Guns. Toxic masculinity and mass shootings. To find out more about this show or to download our podcast, go to radioproject.org. Special thanks to KCSB FM for permission to use their archives and to Vera Tykolsker for production assistance. This show was produced by Monica Lopez. Our executive producer is Lisa Redman, staff producers Anita Johnson, Marie Cha, and RJ Lazada, audience engagement director Sabine Blazan, and development associate Vera Tykolsker. I'm your host, Monica Lopez. Thanks for listening to Making... Rebecca Solnit says, It's the poignant story of someone who started out feeling like the only gay person in the entire world and ends up organizing millions of gay folks. Cleve Jones, long in the San Francisco heart of the struggle for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender rights, 
helped change gay history. He'll tell the story Wednesday evening, January 25th, 7.30 p.m. at St. John's Presbyterian Church, 2727 College Avenue in Berkeley. This KPFA benefit has wheelchair access and free parking. Tickets at brownpapertickets.com or our great independent bookstores. Richard Walensky will host the amazing, inspiring, often outrageous, 